Okay, so welcome to the complexity theory session. So I guess one of the most exciting parts of any anniversary type of celebration is, is the babies, especially when they're MIT professors. Uh, so uh, Ryan Williams will tell us about his REU work, uh, and uh, he's been one of the most influential complexity, young complexity theorists and uh, received many awards for his work and we'll see how it all dates back to uh, Dimex. Thanks, thanks Mark. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So I put uh, the inspiration part in parentheses because you know, maybe that's up to you whether you're, you're inspired. I was certainly inspired. I'm going to talk about my REU at Dimex. Uh, so this was in the summer of 2000, okay? and uh, this was my first job where I was paid to think. And it was very, very exciting to me. Uh, like, I, I had jobs before, but I definitely wasn't thinking <laughs> when I was doing those jobs. So, you know, I, yeah. so a lot of physical labor and stuff. So, so I stayed in a job that looked like, so dorm, that looked like this, it was something like this, you know, this kind of way. And I walked to this building nearly every day, the, the core building. I walked there with papers in hand and pencils and paper, and I tried to think. I tried really, really hard to think, and I, sometimes I was successful. So what did I think about? Uh, well, here's part one. So this is like my official REU project that I had to think about. It was the complexity of reversible computing. So Dieter von Melkebeek at the time was a DIMAX postdoc. He's now a professor at Wisconsin. And he asked the following question. So for every deterministic algorithm that runs in some time t in S space, okay, is there an equivalent reversible algorithm that uses, uh, say, order t of n, so order t time in order S space? So can we get a reversible algorithm with roughly the same kinds of uh, computational bounds? Okay. So just to recall, so deterministic means, of course, that each next step in our computation is unique, so well-defined and so on. Reversible means that also each previous step is well-defined and unique. Okay. So for example, uh, any erasing of information can't be done unless you know exactly what was there and how to go back to it. So, uh, so reversible uh, computation is something possibly stronger than determinism. So we want to know if you can get reversibility with about the same resources as you could with any old deterministic computation. Okay. So this was a hard problem. Okay. Uh, the question is still open. <laughs> All right. I didn't resolve it in my REU, uh, but there were many interesting papers to read. Okay. And I, I read lots of different things. So a couple of papers I read uh, were the following. One was by uh, Charlie Bennett, Time Space Trade-Offs for Reversible Computation. You probably can't read that from here. But uh, what he showed was that for time t and space s algorithms, you can get a reversible algorithm that runs slightly polynomially more time for any, you know, one, t to one plus epsilon for any epsilon you want, and s log t space. So, so uh, this log t is, say, no more than s, so you'll get maybe quadratic uh, space overhead. Okay? That was one simulation that was known, already pretty good. Uh, there was another simulation uh, by Langa, McKenzie, and Tapp, reversible space equals deterministic space. Okay? So this one was extremely space efficient, so it got order s space, a reversible simulation of an s space computation using order s space, but in the worst case, it could take exponential in that amount of space time to the order s time. All right? So these were getting different kinds of trade-offs. This one was very good with respect to time. This one was very good with respect to space. Uh, so my you know, thing was, like, okay, I found something new. And uh, the idea was, well, why can't we have both? So why can't we? So, uh, to, so this is what your kids call a meme. You know, just so <laughs> so yeah, so why can't we just combine uh, these two things in some nice way? Um, and the idea was that Charlie Bennett's simulation has, is a special recursive structure. And there's a base case algorithm where you're just doing some uh, very simple simulation. If we could stick that 
uh, simulation of Lange, McKinsey, and Tap in there, we could get some trade-offs. So this was the paper that I produced in my RU, and one example is that you can get t so, uh, exponential in t over log t time, and s times log log t space. So you could get subquadratic space and sub-exponential time, okay, which was a trade-off that wasn't known at the time. Uh, but it turned out uh, that Berman, Tromp, and Vitani were working on this problem already, and uh, they eventually published this before I figured out how to submit to a conference and so forth. <laughs> so that's fine. But it's still, you know, freely available on the internet and people still cite it, so whatever. It's fine. All right, so, so that's uh, what I thought about part one. That was my official REU project, okay? Uh, and honestly, I haven't thought too much about reversible computation <laughs> since summer of 2000, but I have thought about other things, and that's what part two is about, okay? So, Part two is about the complexity of the SAT problem. Okay, so just so that we're all clear about the definition, uh, in the SAT problem, I'm given the encoding of a propositional logic formula, F, okay, let's say it's composed over and and or not gates with Boolean variables X, and I want to know is there a zero one assignment to these variables that makes the formula output one, okay? Okay, it's the canonical NP-complete problem, and it's in polynomial time if and only if P equals NP. Okay, so understanding its complexity is in, inexorably tied to the P versus NP question, understanding how difficult it is to solve it. Now, uh, at that time, Lance Fortno and Dieter had recently uh, made some progress on the complexity of the SAT problem, uh, improved some work of Dick Lipton and Tassels Viglas from the previous year. So there's uh, Lance uh, roughly around that time. He was at NEC Research and affiliated with DIMAX. So I, I had met him during the RIU, and there's uh, Dick Lipton and Tassel Ziglis. They were at Princeton. So they were all in the, in the same geographic area at this time, and they were working on the SAT problem. Okay. And Dieter was very uh, excited about this very, very new work, and so I started learning about it myself. Uh, so let me back up and talk about the, the kind of theorems they proved. It's about log space versus MP. So not P versus NP, but something called log space versus NP. So P versus NP itself is currently out of reach, okay, as far as I know. I mean, I get a paper every so often that says it resolved it, but it didn't, okay? I mean, but there, there has been non-trivial progress on the question of whether log space equals NP, I would argue. And what is this question? It says, well, so the P versus NP question asks whether this SAT problem has an algorithm running in polynomial time. So log space goes further and asks, is there a SAT algorithm that treats its input as read only, so it can only read off bits of the input, and use the only order log in additional memory, where n is the input length, okay, on formulas encoded in n bits. So uh, this would be a much more constrained thing. So such a thing uh, is going to run in polynomial time, but it is also going to use extremely low space, like much less space than what you would need to even store a candidate satisfying assignment. Uh, so we believe no way, no way is log space equal to NP, because log space is probably properly contained in P itself. Okay? But proving log space different from NP is necessary for proving P different from NP. Okay? So it's a stepping stone uh, on the way. And somehow if you look at uh, the complexity of SAT, when the memory is really bounded, you can prove interesting uh, lower bounds, uh, limitations on computation. And this is what uh, these uh, four guys have been working on. Okay. So uh, log space different from MP is basically equivalent, using the Cook-Levin theorem, to the statement that for all constants k, sat can't be solved in n to the k time in order log n space, for all constants k. All right? So uh, we would have a complete resolution if we had managed to prove like it, there's no n to the 10 time, no n to the 100, n to the billion, so on. What they have shown are there are constants k greater than one for which you can prove this kind of statement. Okay, so there are some non-trivial polynomial lower bounds. Okay, so uh, first of all, Lance proved that there is some epsilon so that sat can't be solved in, into the one plus epsilon time and uh, sub-polynomial space. It's just, you can just think of this as polylog n into the lower one. Okay. And then uh, Dick Lipton and Tassos Viglas had proved in the previous year, my RU, that sat can't be solved in, into the square root of two time in small space. Right. 
And uh, Lance and Dieter had very recently proved that SAT can't be solved and into the golden ratio time in small space. Okay. Creeping up ever so slowly, but going through, you know, some very nice constants, okay? Square root of two, golden ratio, and so on, all right? Um, so what's really nice about these theorems is that they hold for many computational models. They don't depend on having a Turing machine or something like that. They will work for random access machines, like models of programming languages, and so on. So they're very robust to the computational model. Right. And yet you still prove some kind of lower bound, right? We would want the proof into the billion time lower bound, okay? We got it into the golden ratio. Uh, another nice aspect of these theorems, they hold for other NP-complete problems as well. Yes, including TSP, okay? So like vertex cover, Hamiltonian path, max cut, and so on. So, so that's a two nice, uh, robust properties of, of the way in which they prove these things, okay? Right, so how do they prove these things? Uh, it's something that I call a lower bounds by algorithmic arguments. The idea really is a proof by contradiction. So you assume you have a great algorithm for a hard problem. So you assume you have a SAT algorithm using into the 1.4 time in logarithmic space. So you just some really awesome algorithm for the SAT problem, right? And then you want to use this algorithm as a subroutine to design even better algorithms for a harder problem, say like higher up in the polynomial hierarchy, whatever. Like maybe you can use your SAT algorithm uh, on the output of some other SAT algorithm to, to solve some problem. And then you get algorithms so great they do something that you know to be impossible. So one thing we know to be impossible is that you cannot take all quadratic time algorithms and speed them up to run in, into the 1.9 time. Okay? There exist problems that inherently require quadratic time and cannot be sped up. Right? So that's the idea. You have some SAT algorithm which is really fast and really souped up and doing all this good stuff and you want to contradict something that's just false by diagonalization. And so, so this was the, the basic uh, outline, okay? This strategy is an algorithm design problem, okay? You're working with a hypothesis which is probably false, but a lo the whole time you're saying, okay, I'm taking this algorithm, I'm trying to design another algorithm. I'm trying to get an algorithm that works for all quadratic time algorithms and make them run faster. Right? So this is a, uh, how all of their proofs work, okay? And I marveled at this idea for a very long time. And uh, it's safe to say it's been very influential in uh, my work in complexity theory, for sure. This, this idea of getting a contradiction by, by speeding up generically any, any old algorithm. Right. So let me give sort of one slide overview of how these things work. Um, it's you know, maybe a little technical, but after that it, it will not be technical. Okay. So this will be the argument of Lipton and Biglis from 99. So we're going to suppose that uh, can be solved at the end of the C time in log space for some parameter C. Okay, and we're going to try to make C as large as possible in our argument. So then, because SAT is NP-complete, has very nice NP-completeness reductions, it will follow that every problem solvable in non-deterministic end to the K time is solvable in essentially end to the C K time in log space. Okay, just because you could take any such problem, code it as a SAT instance of about end to the K, and then solve it in end to the C K time using your fast algorithm. Okay, so just because SAT is NP-complete, it can solve any non-deterministic problem. So in complexity notation, this is saying for all k, in time into the k, non-deterministic time into the k, is in time space in the CK log n. So the first parameter is time, the second parameter is space. Right? So then the, the second step is to use a, a very interesting trick which generalizes uh, a work of, of Savage's theorem and, and Neponashi from a long time ago, it says that there is a way to generically speed up small space computations with so-called alternating algorithms. So the formal statement is that everything running in, say, into the CK time and log in space can be simulated in a, uh, with a square root speed up by having a machine that first starts working existentially, so it works like a non-deterministic algorithm, and it's guessing a computation path. And then at some point it switches and it alternates to trying all possible paths in parallel. Okay. At a really high level, what this thing is doing is it's sort of guessing uh, what the computation is going to look like in the future for uh, this square root number of times. So because the space usage of the algorithm is so small, 
you could store this without many bits. So you could, because the space you use is so small, you could say, I'm going to guess what it's going to look like at all these different steps in the future, and then universally try all the different steps and see that from one uh, of these you get to the next snapshot. So there's a way of kind of brute forcing uh, in this way and speeding the thing up. Right? So in complexity notation, this is saying that this time space class is in sigma 2 time, but with a square root speed up. And finally, applying the SAT algorithm again, there's this universal part. It's really a co-MP type part, okay? You can replace that with a deterministic computation. And when all the dust is settled, you get that n time into the k is an n time into the c squared k over 2, all right? And so together, all these inclusions imply that uh, you have into the k and into the c squared k over 2. So when c is less than the square root of 2, this is false by the non-deterministic time hierarchy, right? It means that you will have a speed up here greater than what you started with. And you can't just arbitrarily speed up any algorithm, including non-deterministic ones. You can't just re-implement a non-deterministic algorithm and, and speed it up generically, right? So it's starting with this assumption that SAT has a, a, a efficient algorithm and applying it two different ways in some very interesting combination to get some uh, impossibility result. So I learned all this at, while I was at Dimex in the RAU, but, but I didn't prove anything else new with it. It took me a few more years to understand what was actually going on. And so eventually, uh, I got something which was a lot nicer looking than the golden ratio. Okay. So SAT can't be solved in into the 2 times cosine pi over 7 time in small space. Okay. Well, you know, co we know cosine is bounded, so it can't be too large. Uh, right? So it's, but it's, you know, about 1.801, all right? And it's the largest root of a certain cubic equation, which you get by doing some extreme elaboration of the argument on the previous slide in, like, two different ways, okay? That's fine. Uh, so, but this 2 cosine pi over 7 thing really dogged me in. So it turned out all the above lower bounds and more could be unified under a common formal proof system. Like, there was a way to really nail down exactly what was going on, sort of what is the optimal choice of things going on in this proof. In fact, it could be reduced to linear programming. Uh, and so I had uh, written a theorem prover, I put it in quotes because I, I, mean, I was coding in Maple and things like this, to find new proofs. And eventually we found with Sam Buss that in fact, this very strange odd exponent turns out to be the best possible for this proof system. Everyone had conjectured that you should get quadratic time, uh, but it's, this is still an open problem. So, but as you can see, this was a bit after, you know, the, the summer of 2000, okay? Uh, so it took a few years to kind of really understand this problem, all right? Um, but the influence on my work was actually deeper than, than just uh, improving uh, some results that, you know, were incrementing towards, say, log space in from NP. No, it was, it was a lot more than that. So slowly, I began thinking about every lower bound problem uh, as a potential algorithmic argument. So, and uh, the, men the mentality was like, I want to prove there is no good algorithm for my problem X. And I'm going to do this by assuming that there is a good algorithm and go, like going all out trying to apply this algorithm and, and speed things up and somehow derive again that say non-deterministic time t is in non-deterministic time little o of t. So that I can take a time t algorithm and generically speed it up faster, okay? which would give a contradiction. And so I began thinking about any problem I wor worked on as this kind of, like, could I potentially do this thing? Seems like, okay. So of course, much of the time, that approach doesn't make a lot of sense. Like sometimes there's just no non-determinism in your problem to begin with, so you know, what's, what's the deal? Um, but I had a suspicion this kind of thinking could be used to attack a very challenging question of Eric Allender, who is the next speaker here. And he had been, you know, he, he would like to say this uh, very embarrassing thing about complexity. Like, we can't even prove X. And then, you know, where X is the most outlandish statement, it almost certainly, you know, must be true, but we can't, we can't resolve it one way or another. So one of the ones he would say is, is NX contained in ACC0. What, is, what does all this word salad mean? Or what do all these letters mean? Um, so in a sentence, it 
ask, can all problems with exponentially long answers checkable in exponential time? That's in x. So in p is polynomial length answers checkable in polynomial time. In x is exponentially long answers checkable in exponential time. Okay, so in all problems like that, can they be solved with non-uniform polynomial size circuit families of constant depth with, say, a very limited gate basis? So you're only using like some very limited counting and ors and ands and nots. Okay, but like. We know that exponential time can't be simulated in polynomial time. That's the time hierarchy theorem. And so it doesn't make sense that somehow if you use like circuit families, then so somehow you would get a containment. So almost certainly no. Okay? I'm not going to give you a full definition. For the purpose of this talk, ACC just means annoying circuit class. Okay? <laughs> so it is just an extremely annoying like computational model, which looks obviously very, very weak. But yet, uh, for 30 years, no one had any clue how to prove any, almost anything non-trivial about like uh, its limitations. Okay? So, so this is how you get the, to the point where you have outlandish questions like this, which are still open. Right? Um, so I managed to prove in 2011 that uh, NX is not in ACC0. And since then, there have been a lot of improvements on that particular theorem. Um, and they all take an algorithmic argument in them. They all, they all take this mentality, which I learned very well uh, in, in my REU at DIMAX. Okay? Uh, so, so I'll say at a really high level what's going on in the proof. So let C be some typical circuit class. So you could think of them as Boolean formulas as one class, arbitrary circuits, however they're wired as another class, whatever you like. There's a generic connection between designing SAT algorithms for a circuit class and proving lower bounds limitations on that circuit class. So, so theorem A in the proof says that if the SAT problem on n input n of the k size C circuits can be solved slightly faster than 2 to the n time. So 2 to the n is exhaustive search, okay? That, you definitely have an algorithm that runs in 2 to the n times the, the size. If you could do it in 2 to the n divided by the size, okay? Then you would get NX doesn't have polynomial size C circuits. You would be able to uh, prove a limitation on circuits from that uh, theorem. This is a generic way to get lower bounds from algorithms solving the SAT problem. Notice that like I was proving lower bounds in the SAT algorithm on, on the complexity of SAT. And here I'm talking about, well, actually, if you can beat exhaustive search for SAT, then you get a lower bound too. So this is a, this is a very different regime where I was trying to prove like very limited SAT lower bounds. And here I'm just saying if you get any improvement over exhaustive search algorithmically, you get another kind of lower bound. All right. And uh, the second theorem B was that for this weird ACC, annoying circuit class, there was a SAT algorithm that actually worked very well. And it was just an algorithmic way of looking at a representation that everyone suspected should imply lower bounds, but uh, we just couldn't figure out how. All right, so these are like the two components of the proof. But uh, this theorem A is really where the algorithmic argument idea uh, comes in. All right, so, so let me say a little bit more about this at a high level. Uh, the idea is that uh, interesting SAT algorithms uh, tell us about the limitations of circuits. So just to look at the quantifier structure a little bit more. Suppose I have a Turing machine. Okay, this is my depiction of a Turing machine. There exists a Turing machine that, such that for all circuits whose descriptions are written on the tape, um, I can determine whether that circuit is satisfiable or not, whether it's computing the all zeros function or whether it has a satisfying assignment. And this thing runs in somehow faster than it, brute force. Brute force on an input circuit would take two to the n time, I'm running somehow faster than that, two to the n divided by some large polynomial. Okay? So there exists an algorithm such that for all circuits I can do this. Okay? There is a generic way to take uh, such an algorithm and say from that algorithm I can construct an interesting function, some interesting function, in this case one in, in x, this, this in x class, so that for all circuits uh, that from this, of the same class, I can prove every finite slice of f. So when I restrict f to some finite number of inputs, it cannot have a circuit from that class. All right. So this is a way in which algorithm design, something that people generally think is easier than lower bounds, can be used to directly prove lower bounds. And I hope the quantifier structure makes it a little bit clearer how such a result might be proved at all. So let me give you the idea of theorem A, uh, because it will look familiar uh, to uh, uh, if you know it, uh, 
the previous uh, kinds of approaches. So the idea of this theorem A, so we want to say if we have uh, a SAT algorithm, then we can get this circuit lower bound. So we're going to assume that we have the small circuits we want. Okay, we're going to assume NX has small circuits, and there is a faster SAT algorithm. Okay, we're, these are both positive algorithmic assumptions, and we're going to use them to show that non-interpretic time to the end can be sped up. Okay, we're going, so we're going to get an algorithmic argument, and this will be a contradiction. So it means that if there were a faster SAT algorithm, then there must not be these circuits for NX. Right? So, so this entire thing is still an algorithmic argument in the, in the style that I was learning way back when. Okay. Right, so let me sort of unpack what that means. What does it mean to say that non-interimistic time to the end can be sped up? Well, what does it mean for a problem to be a non-interimistic to the end time? Well, given an input X, uh, how do you compute uh, uh, the language on the input X in non terms of in time, you do it by first guessing a witness of order to the n length, right? That's the first part. And then the second part is checking that that is a witness, and that takes order to the n time. Right? This is how non-determinism works. You guess, you check, right? All right, so we want to speed up both of those steps. We're going to speed up step one, so it runs faster into the end. We're going to speed up step two, so it runs faster into the end. And we want to use our two assumptions that we have small circuits and we have a faster SAT algorithm. So, that's, so we want to do this kind of speed up. And so here's how we're going to do it at a really high level. So given an input x, we're going to compute it faster by first using the assumption that nx has small circuits to in fact guess a witness which has uh, less than 2 the n length. And this is using something uh, proved by Impadiazo, Kaudetz, and Vigerson called the easy witness lemma. Basically it says if you have nx, if nx has small circuits, then every verifier in NX will also have a small circuit encoding a good witness for it, all right? So, so we can use the, uh, this assumption to guess a, the witness faster, and then we can use the faster SAT algorithm to check the, the succinct witness faster. Right? And this is going to use the fact that NX has complete problems under very strong reductions. This is uh, also tied back to the original DIMAX work, because this is where I actually learned uh, a proof that uh, problems in NX will have, be complete under very tight reductions. You need this kind of tight reduction to even prove the SAT lower bounds on the small space that I was talking about. Right? So the idea is you guess this witness, which is small, and then you set up some very l large uh, circuit set instance, which has got that thing embedded inside, and it's sort of checking the constraints of some uh, succinctly described exponentially large three set instance. Okay? And then you run a SAT algorithm on that to check that all the constraints of that thing are satisfied. That's a really, really high level idea of how it works. But uh, in the end, it's just an algorithmic argument. It's just trying to get a generic speed up for an automatic time. All right? So there have been many more uh, such results in recent years. Uh, uh, basically out of time, uh, and, but you know, there are lots more to say. There's even improvements on everything I said before. I just wanted to give you a small glimpse in a, a few minutes about how influential this era you really was for me in my career. So let me just say happy birthday, Dimax. Thanks, Ryan. So we have time for a question or two. So, uh, generally speaking, we are much better at algorithms than proving lower bounds. So, are there specific kind of alg algorithmic... S s so, is there a conceivable upper bound that would get us, say, close to L versus NP or any of those really strong... Algorithmic problem whose solution would imply, say, L different from MP. Or, or yeah. Or even P different from MP. Say. Uh, so, say, you're, you're, anything that's conceivably kind of possible, we can figure out. Yes. This is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. But I don't, I mean, uh, to even describe the setup will take more time than I have. So. <laughs> but, but, yeah, yes, there is definitely a way to view 
uh, a plausible algorithmic problem such that getting, getting say, a polynomial time algorithm for this problem implies L different from NP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's think right again.